Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Behold, your King is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. As we experienced this morning with our children and heard in our children's message, many of the people were excited that the King was coming. I've often wondered, though, what Satan was thinking as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. I had this sneaking suspicion he was holding his hands like this and had an evil grin on his face, just waiting for what was getting ready to come. Legend tells us that once upon a time, a long time ago, there was a city named Troy. Troy was located on the coast of Asia, across the sea from the Greek city-state of Sparta. In those days, people used to build up walls around their city to help protect them, and within those walls there would be gates to let people in or out. They would definitely let friendly people in and put the gates to the walls up whenever they were worried about someone not friendly coming in. The walls around Troy were very high and very strong, and according to legend, for ten long years, the Greeks had been trying to get over the wall around the city of Troy, but they never could. And for ten long years, the Trojans could not drive the Greeks away. Year after year, they fought, and neither side won. One day, a Greek general named Odysseus had an idea. Let's pretend to sail away, he suggested. We will leave a gift for Troy, a gift to announce the end of the war, a a large wooden horse. This was, of course, the way things were done back then. When you admitted defeat, you supplied a gift. It could be money or art or slaves, anything really. It made sense to leave a gift of art, for the Greeks were famous for their art. And the horse was the emblem for the city of Troy. Could this finally trick the Trojans? The Greeks thought it was a brilliant idea. They had their best artists build a magnificent horse, bigger than any horse anyone had ever seen. When it was ready, the Greeks brought it to the huge, uh, to the, the gates of, of Troy and got it as close to the city gates as they could without being shot full of arrows. Then the Greeks pretended to sail away. When the Trojan archers saw the Greeks leaving, they couldn't believe their eyes. Were the Greeks giving up at last? Had the Trojans finally won the war? It certainly appeared so. The Trojans dragged the horse into their city, closed the gates, and celebrated. But the horse, of course, had a little surprise for the Trojans. Hidden inside were 30 Greek soldiers, and later that night, as the people of Troy slept soundly, exhausted from their celebrations, the 30 Greeks inside that wooden horse climbed out, opened up the gates to the city of Troy, and let the Greek army inside. And that was the end of Troy. Today is... Palm Sunday, a day in the church year where we celebrate a humble donkey bearing a rabbi from Nazareth into the city of Jerusalem. But once inside, he conquers sin, death, and the devil to set us free. Like the Greeks and the Trojans, we have been in a prolonged battle. Sin has seized control of the human race. It's not just a misdeed here or a misjudgment there. Rather, sin is a force that controls our entire lives. And though we are thousands of years removed from the chariots of Ephraim and the war horse of Jerusalem, we know about the consequences of sin and the brokenness of our lives. And as with the Greeks and God's people of Zechariah's time, It can seem sometimes as if the battle has been lost. We are like the exiles in Babylon who could not free themselves. Like the people of Judah who first returned from captivity. We are unable to defeat our enemy of sin. We are those prisoners in that waterless pit, trapped in a grave of despair. But God 
has a plan to set us free. His humble king rides a donkey into Jerusalem. The city welcomes him with wild celebration, but then the city is besieged from within as that humble king does battle with sin. Jerusalem will turn and will start to fight back, and by the end of the week, that humble king will hang in shame on a cross. It will seem as if evil has won, but that is also part of the plan. Satan is duped. Before he knows it, the king will appear in power. The king will be alive in Satan's own fortress. The king only appears weak and helpless. It's actually his humility that is his most powerful weapon. Jesus never exalts himself. He remains truly innocent. His weapon in the war against sin is his own active righteousness. His greatest weapon is his obedience to God's plan, which then in turn gets credited to us. We get to experience salvation when Jesus' active righteousness is put in our place and when his passive righteousness happens on the cross. Our salvation is won as Jesus receives upon him the full weight of the sin of mankind. Jesus sheds his blood and dies according to God's covenant with us. And then he rises again to present himself in hell as victor over Satan. All this according to God's plan. That blood covenant that he made with his people long ago. That blood covenant does cut off the power of Satan and sets us free. And so, like the people of Jerusalem, we shout aloud, for we are restored as God's children and given the victory that we never could win for ourselves. In his word and at his table, we are renewed in that blood covenant as we receive the fruits of Christ's ultimate sacrifice for us. Being renewed in that covenant means that we are now part of his body, the church. The church that is still at war with Satan, as Satan tries desperately to keep the church from proclaiming the gospel. The prince of this world may sometimes seem like he is winning, but he has not learned his lesson that was taught on Calvary's hill. And because of that, you and I are sent every day on a mission by Christ himself. We are Christ's Trojan horses living in this world, but not of the world, living in a world shrouded with darkness, but bearing the light of Christ in us. We look just like all those who are lost. We eat and drink, we laugh and cry, we suffer and hope, we're born and we die. Visually speaking, there is nothing different from you and me and everyone else, except for this one thing, that when those in the world that person who might be your friend, your relative, your neighbor, or the stranger in your midst, when they least expect it, Christ opens up his Trojan horse and sends us out so that we can share his love and his truth and his forgiveness. So rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, for blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This humble king who rides into Jerusalem truly is the son of God. And once he enters into the city, much to the horror of his enemies, there is no stopping him. He sets us free that we may follow in his example of great humility and patience and forgiveness. That we may proclaim his victory, knowing with full confidence that his victory is our victory as well. In Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our service continues with the prayers of the church. Please rise.